My dad's coming up to 90 and he's he, he might as well be on Tinder, you know. He's getting more hookups than I am. Do you understand? It's, it's unbelievable. The last time I went to Jamaica, about four years ago, my dad was at the bay in Port... Uh, it was in... Um, oh, he's in Mansion Hill. And there was this young lady, younger than me. She had on the whole shorts, everything. And she was over at my dad. Daddy! And I was like, oh my God! Who's this girl? Is she my sister? She was like, no, I'm your dad's woman. I was like, no, this is crazy. She was very young. So I think those things keep him alive. But it definitely makes me think about the difference between my mum and my dad. And I think, knowing that they were Jamaican, growing up as a child, born, born in, in England, raised in East London, born in Hackney, I always had that excitement. Like if I saw Bob Marley, if I saw anything about Jamaica, I'm Jamaican, mm -hmm. I was really proud. And I think that generation is really old school. They're different to the generation now. They really embrace their culture. If if it was a Sunday and we didn't have rice and peas, something was wrong. The only time I remember not having Sunday dinner was my mum had had a stroke. And that's, you know, that is so significant because the culture was so, um, it was so stamped into me from a young age. Mm -hmm. um, I never went to Jamaica until I was about, I think I was like 20 something. Yeah, yeah, I'd really? lost contact with my dad. Mm -hmm. My dad was always there um, and I lost contact with my dad. He went to Jamaica when I was about 17. You know, he said he was going, he was fine with it. I was upset for a bit because I started to go around him much more when I was 13 because I realised, hold on, this dude can give me money. <laughs> Keep it real. This dude could give me. If I turn up, he's gonna give me money. I'm gonna take the pressure off my mum. So I'm gonna go get money. And we had that little bit of a relationship. He wasn't a bad dad. Mm. It's not like he didn't love me or didn't want to be around. I just really started to understand now at this age how your culture, how your beliefs, how attachment and loss can actually contribute to what you might see as being a significant parent. And I think my dad's dream of going back home is that was his main focus. Not not necessarily because he didn't care about me. He just that's all he knew. That's all he knew. This was to me, this is this is where I live. But to him he was kinda of alien. He was alien in this situation. So when he was about, I was about seventeen he went back home yeah. and um I had a few years contact with him, about about five years, and then I lost contact. It's just that whole letters and phone numbers and reverse calls and my mum cussing and putting on the phone just e reverse and call pardon me like you know where's my child benefit all them kind of you know them kind of things but their relationship was really weird there was never no hate my dad got married again he became a the witness when he was over here which was really strange for us because mum was christian but you know after he separated with his his wife my mum and dad were still kind of friends. He'd always come back, oh, you know, you're the best cook out of all the women I have. And my mum loved that because she was known for her food. So they had that good balance, you know, and I think that is really important. Little mix-up. <laughs> the guy who we bought the flights from was actually working for a big company and he was doing some kind of dodgy business. And we paid the three hundred pound, thinking that that was flight and hotel, and actually he'd used the company's card to pay. Yeah, so we <laughs> we ended up we was in Runaway Bay. Yeah, Runaway Bay is nice. I got the way it gets interesting. We was in Runaway Bay. The first night we ended up in Montego Bay, and we stayed in this hotel. And I remember we landed; it was dark, so I couldn't see anything. Everyone telling me about Jamaica, Jamaica. What I found really strange is when I stepped off the plane I swear I could smell food it's, that's, that's, I could smell this this you know this smell that I smell in my mum's house on a Sunday but it was just so when I think about it I can almost smell it now it's just so vibrant and then I was shocked that there were so much black people 
I've never seen so much black people in my life. I was, I was like, my God, I'm British. What is going on? Why is there so many? Well, I was absolutely shocked. And then I had to think, Judy, you're black. Why are you so shocked? And it made me realise, you know, where I live, obviously, it's a predominantly white, um, you know, country, but you don't really realise it until you step out. Um, and it made me realise how much of my own culture and identity I didn't really know. So the fact that I could step up a plane and be so overwhelmed by seeing so many black people. So growing up then, what was being Jamaican for you? How did you enact that? How did you keep on to that? Being Jamaican was the, the food. Yeah, that was a definite. The food, um, having really good relationships, friendships, uh, memories, laughter. Laughter. It, it doesn't matter what situation happened in our, in our home. You know, my mum being unwell, you know, my mum being a single parent, you know, just working class, there was always laughter. If it was at a funeral, if it was at a wedding, if it was at a christening, to me that was what being Jamaican was about. The food, the good vibes, um, the unionship together. So that was my forefront of what being Jamaican is, the music, obviously Bob Marley. I, I was. In my eyes, I was related to him, you know, that's it, I was related, I grew up, I'm going to have a husband like Bob Marley, I actually grew a lot in the back of my hair for about four years that my mum didn't know, because my mum was that old school where they didn't like locks, yeah, that, there's a generation that didn't really like it, and so I had one at the back of my, my head, and my mum found it, and I never had it again when I woke up in the morning. <laughs> Were you funny when almost, I was, uh, as a kid, you know? Yeah. It, it's, it's, I remember, um, like, mimicking my mum. So she was this, you know, big, big chest, big bum, little ankles, tiny, I don't know, little chicken foot. I don't know how she balanced all of that. I don't know, your legs. Oh, bless her. Yeah. And, you know, she had the big curly perm. You know, little floral dresses and the Mac. I think every Jamaican woman that age had the Mac, you know, and the brown tights. And um, she just was a, she was a character. Facial expressions. For example, my name is Judy. For all my life, she called me Judy. Now, I don't understand that. You named me. Shar, Shar, It's Sharon, Mum. Mr. Dabitzer, Shar. It was never. And then it was a whole... Trying to be posh Jamaican. Oh, good evening. Yes, I was I was going to call, and uh, you came to the house. Why are you talking about? No, to come to the house. And then she would still turn and say, "Mr. Shut your mouth, Johnny. The house. Yes, it'd be nice if you come to the house." But still could cuss me off in that split second and go back. Or like if we go to church, it's a Sunday, and I'm rude. She's like, Jesus Christ, you're going to make me bust your ass on Sunday. Ask me just praise me luck. But it, it, it was just, she was just so vibrant, such a character. And I used to mock her. I used to uh, stand behind her like when family, because my mum was like the, the big head of the family. She was like one of the first to come over, then sent for her other sisters and sent for her sister's partner. And she was one of the ones that had all the cousins. You know, all her siblings, first child, she looked after him for a little while. So she was like the big mama, uh, the, you know, auntie to everybody. So Easter, Christmas, everybody would come round and her food, not just because it was my mum, her food was, oh, it was delightful. So I used to just, I used to just mimic her. I used to stand behind her <laughs> and all those kind of shit. We had up! And everyone would laugh. So that's, I think, where. I remember being so, you know, comical or having some kind yeah. of comedy element. Because that's another classic cliche question to ask the comedian, you know, did you get out of situations? Did you survive in a way because you were funny? Was that, was that a weapon? I, being think, funny? I think so. Being funny was, I think being funny was definitely a coping mechanism. You know, I, I had a significant trauma when I was nine. My mum being sick in front of me, you know, she collapsed in front of me, just me and her in the house. And that took me years of, um, 
I couldn't even say the words without crying, having panic attacks. So I think after a while, it was like, okay, well, what was funny at this situation? You know, like, my mum's had a bleed in her brain, an aneurysm. She's been in hospital for 18 months. She was in a coma for possibly about six months. And then she wakes up, and the first thing she wants is rice and peas. Like, to me. <laughs> Where am I? Am I alive, or is that Jesus? No. But the rice and peas. Yeah. Rice and we brought her rice and peas in a pot, and she was scooping in the bed. In the pot. Like, it's just comical. Uh, there was a nap, she had about four or five strokes. There was another time she had a stroke, and this guy liked me, and he wasn't really my typical type. He was Jamaican, but he was quite big. And, and I, I, you know, he, I said, oh, my mum's sick, oh my God. And he's like, don't worry, I'll take you, I'll take you to the hospital. Really nice guy. Took me to the hospital, and my mum, <laughs> she had the gas mark on. And she, she'd had a stroke, yeah, and they were like, your mum's had a stroke, and da da da, we're just here, blood pressure, and so and so. We went in, and she was there, and she had the mask. I was like, Mom, Mom, and she'd lift the mask up and she looked at you and went, I'm not dead yet. You don't need to bring in any riff raff. <laughs> Lift her head back and put the mask on. I was just like, who is this woman? Who is she? And he said, what are your mother said? I said, and that is, um, the, the medic, sometimes this is what strokes that. So that, it was like, okay, I can tell my family this. Instead of them going through the pain, you know, like, actually, let's talk about this. Let's laugh mm. about this. And that is what happens every time. Mm. So I, I probably was that healing place for a lot of my family, mm. you know, because for someone you love to have so many strokes, it will have a, a, a heavy knock on you. So actually, what was the funny bit? These were the funny bits. Yeah. And these are... F and so you, you used the funny bits as a, a way of getting through yeah. the trauma? Yeah, yeah. What do you mean by this, uh, the power of comedy? Just that it's a platform for you to talk about subjects that many people need to talk about or listen to, but they won't. And you could do it in such a clever way that they don't even realise, like I said earlier, they don't realise or laugh about it, but later on they might actually think about what you said. And it's quite healing. You know, you, you can have a room with 100 people, 20% of those people are suffering with depression. And for that 20 minutes, you've just cleared their mind. You clear their mind. For myself, it's healing. Yes, I'm a comedian. Yes, I can, I'm on TV. Yes, I'm on social media. But we all have, I'm, I'm a single parent. I have a child that's a teenager. Uh, I have a son that's eight and four years ago. He was in intensive care. So there's all, I have my own issues. You know, I still always face the fact of, you know, my mum had five strokes. I'm at that age now where I've really got to take care of my own body. Those things will come into my mind. So it can be a stressful day. You can have lots of money one month and the next month maybe you're like, Jesus Christ. Yeah? So it, it, it's all there. So sometimes I get on the stage and I've rushed, you know, I've dropped off the kids, and da -da -da, oh my God, petrol quick, da -da -da -da. and I've got there in that kind of yeah. panic and I get on that stage and it's just like, I feel so free. Yeah. And uh, and that free feeling is 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 lovely. However trivial it can sometimes be, if, if you're talking about Mary Berry or something, it's still rooted in something very powerful. Yeah, <laughs> it is because you, you can see you've been somewhere. Yeah, you've been somewhere, and then now I've got something to talk about, and and I feel like I I can touch on these topics. I can touch on being a single parent in the worst way yeah. I can touch on losing somebody I can touch on dementia I can touch on relationships I can touch on depression because I've been inside of all of them all at once and I think that what I've learned is the issue with some people is that why they suffer so much is because we don't talk about it especially in the black community so now it's like okay you don't want to talk about it I'm going to let you, I'm gonna let you yeah. laugh about it yeah, yeah. and then you're going to go home and go Oh, that was funny, but actually, oh my God. You know, I, I talk about mental health. As West Indians, we don't say, oh, you know, um, Janet has mental health. We say, she's not good. So I'm not like, it's a phobia. Somebody, she eat from somebody. She, you know, mental, she mental. Like, we have no, <laughs> we have no political correctness yeah. at all. 
So it's like, okay, instead of just going to each, you know, you mustn't say that. These is learnt behaviour. This is what some know, not all, yeah, yeah. some. So actually, let's laugh about it so they can laugh at themselves, don't feel as judged, and then actually reflect. And maybe the next time they go to say, men, they'll think, oh yeah, I remember when you, oh, she's have, you know, mental health problems. It might sink in mm-hmm. a little bit better. I performed the other day at the Angel Club, I will say their name, and I was the only black person there, apart from actually one other brother, a uh, black guy, and he looked like he was in the film, Get Out. He, he, <laughs> he looked so scared. I was, I was like, you all right, brother? He was like, I can't talk. <laughs> I swear to God. He was, I was looking at him, his woman must have been like, I want a black man. And she got him and she was like, that's not the kind of black man I want. I want a Tyrone. I want the police to be called when they see me with him. I want someone to say to me, are you okay? Have you been kidnapped? But he was so, he was, I said, are you, brother? You? So I was, and then I just touched her over and went, okay, I am the only black person here. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, and I just address it. So I think at the beginning, I was very naive to it. You know, I just thought comedy was comedy, just make people laugh and that's yeah, it. Yeah. You know, so it is universal, it's not really, but then I started to realise. You, you have to get involved in things that really aren't really part of the, you know, you don't really want to think about them as a comedian. You don't want to think about race. You don't want to think about it. You, you just want to transcend all of that and just be it's funny. Funny, yeah. That's, uh, when I started that, it was like, yeah, just you know, talk about stuff, dating, and you know, just want to be funny. But as you grow into it, I think as you grow into who you are as a comedian, I now realise I have to address race, racism, discrimination. Um, I've been told by agents, look, you're a woman and a black woman and a Caribbean black woman, uh, working class. Some people are too frightened to book you. Some TV companies might be too nervous to book you because you can actually speak to the majority, whether they are white, Asian, it could be a white person that is working class you're going to be able to hit them with something you know it could be an asian person that has been discriminated there's so many different areas women it could be middle class white women but Mm. they're women so i still can talk about things that they would face so i think it's a good thing if i'm in a room of a hundred people and everybody is white i'm just one black female you know i've come from a single parent home I'm working class. I'm educated now. Um, you know, I'm a single parent myself. It's all different. It's, it's sometimes it's classism. It's not necessarily racism. And I can make everybody laugh. They're, they're never going to forget that. People will forget what you said, but they will always remember how you made them feel. And we've got to be re- real about it. It might be somebody that's met a black woman before and, you know, they, they've, they didn't have a great interaction, but that interaction they've had with me might change their perception. And I think that is what could bring people together. Sometimes racism is more about the unknown. You know, I'm not sure of what, what you people do. Mm-hmm. I'm not, sh- you know, I'm a bit worried. You know, you're going to cut me up and sell me? Like, they're not sure it's what they've heard. So when you kind of clarify of the things that they're not too sure about, then they're like, okay, it's not like that. I think social media has had a great impact mm. um, are you surprised though that in a way i'm thinking traditionally once upon a time if i may be so complimentary someone as funny as you by now would have had a tv series oh but yeah I, drink I, the rub. I, I don't want to make you depressed or anything but you haven't but on the other hand you've been able to transmit an extraordinary amount of material extraordinary amount of uh, topics and subjects and responses to things through social media that is, you know, I don't know if it makes you as financially remunerate, but it, but it certainly allows you the, the expression to get it out, which a comedian needs to do. Mm. You get out an, mm. an extraordinary amount of material. I think, regards to a TV series, yes, I think you're right. I have had, I have quite a few well-established, famous artists that are, I'm in direct contact with me, and one, I, you know, I did um, a one-on-one interview with, and they were just like, I don't, I don't understand how people, the people that need to know about you don't know about you. I've had commissioners 
big commissioners that are Judy, look, I'm rooting for you. So I know there's people rooting for me. So what's what's stopping it? Then? I think from at the moment, from my point of view, I, do you know what is a stopping it? Um, there's this kind of ageism at the moment, and this whole um, reality TV. Right. So there's certain TV channels that want to get that 16 to 25. Right. Yeah, that 16 to 25, and that's their aim where there's others that are still rooting for just quality comedy. If you look, reality TV has taken over. And how does it happen in terms of your response to things? It's almost like, it's almost journalistic sometimes as well. You respond very quickly to things, uh, phenomenons and trends. You know, obviously your, your hit single at the moment is the Wakanda thing. Yeah. It's a, it's sort of, you know. Or the wind rush, the wind rush at the wind moment. Wind rush, yeah, with is, uh, Miss Amber. Yeah. Yeah. So what happens? What's the process? Is it is it as spontaneous as it seems? Do you prepare? Do you think you? No, I just I, you know it. Maybe I'm watching the news or this morning or something. I'm like, oh my god! And then I just go on a tangent. Like my manager, <laughs> I have to pray for him sometimes, because sometimes he's like, what are you doing? What's happened? Are you there? Are you there? What's going on? I'm like, oh my god! And he's just like, okay, all right, focus. Da-da. So he does give me that free space, but he's, he's a great manager because he really understands about structure, discipline, um, consistency, but he allows me to be this kind of free spirit of whether it's a rant or this has happened, I just want to mm. talk about this. Da, 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 da. He never says, oh no, change that bit, or why don't you become more like this? Or why don't you go, he's just very, he will have, oh, I feel for him, sometimes we're on the phone for two hours, an hour, and I'm just I'm going off about everything. The kids, the school, this. Cancel tax has gone up. I could be going off about anything and then a topic. But he just goes through it with me. You know, he'll just conversate. And the the greatness comes out. Um, not in a big-headed way. I mean the greatness about the subject. No, I'll, I'll say it with greatness. I'll tell oh, you greatness. thanks. <laughs> no, I'm going to tell you it's greatness. Thanks. And that's why I'm interested in the idea that what it must be at a certain point in, in your what we call a career that amount of material, that amount of confidence you have, that amount of funniness you have, do you feel that you, you, you're kind of held back because it can only go through social media? Or am I being old-fashioned? In a way, that's the best place that you can do it. Um, I, don't, I don't feel held back, but I think there will always sometimes be a level of frustration, you know, especially if you watch TV and you see something and you think, come on, man. Yeah. Like, I could have wrote something better than that, or, you know, I could do that character. But this is where it's about being grounded. This is where it's about really, you know, obviously I hope, you know, the end result is that I'm on TV and there's that kind of acknowledgement for my work. But actually my purpose might be doing those videos and I have people message me saying, I'm going through chemo and I watch your video through every session of chemo and it's got me through and these people i've given them free tickets and met them it's not a joke they're real people i've i've stood um at a show and cried with cancer victims and um, people have been depressed like so many different people who you know themselves was dyslexic and now they're lawyers so when they're coming to me and saying that video or this or i didn't know my rights or this it really helped me through I don't think that a, a, a series could take that feeling away, mm. you know? So I have to be quite grounded in myself. Um, there will always be a level of frustration, but then I'll use that frustration to fuel me into probably making another video. Um, yeah. And did you know you'd hit something with Wakanda, with the Wakanda piece? Did you Do know, you know you'd... what? I put Wakanda up. And then I was like, yeah, this is a good video. And I put the phone down. Beep, beep, beep. I thought, oh, God. Beep, beep. I thought, oh, let me look at it. And it was like 3,000. About half an hour. I was like, oh, my God. I don't even care if I don't get deported. Like, it was kind of... They just kept on going and going. I've had, I've been invited to Australia. I've, it just... And I found my manager and he was like, Judy... Judy, this one, my, the, it's going off. It's just, and I was like, this thing is rising. It is going, it is going. And it just, yeah. Uh, when I watch it back, I laugh. I, I can watch back some of mine. That is quite narcissistic. I watch back some of mine and I do laugh. 
Um, but that Wakanda video is just me throwing this on. Yeah. It's just what every woman, I'd say black woman at that time, thought. Like, what the hell? And you got that kind of breed of man in wherever Wakanda is, I'm going. Pack your bags. Let's go. Like, it was just, it, it's just what you would think. There's so many single women out here and single black women. You're like, are you crazy? There's a place that exists. I'm, I'm going. I don't care about cats. So take the house. I'm going. That's, a, that's what most people thought. So I was like, yeah, let me just put that down in the video. And it worked. So, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going with Wakanda, though. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you so much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much.